Welcome to Reroll Multiple Martial Arts Podcast, where we discuss the intersections between martial arts, society, and culture. I'm Elliot. Danny. And so, Danny, we talked about, you know, the the issues between, or just, this, you know, just comparing martial arts, martial artists, brawlers, and so on in our last conversation. So we wanted to pick up on that. Um, so... And you were talking about martial artists and skill sets and, you know, other people having different skill sets or no martial arts skill sets. You know, what, what, what's your, um, would you like to continue your thought on that? I remember we were talking about uh, this position of what makes a martial artist. I believe you had asked me if I thought of myself as a martial artist and I asked you, uh, what you thought about it. And one of the things I remember about that conversation has to do with uh, trying to make sense of what that word implies, what that phrase implies. And one of the things that I felt somewhat confident about stating is that um, there's a couple of things we know it probably can't fully be marked by. And it has to do with skill set. So I think you, you, the skill set has to be there to call yourself a martial artist, but if you only think about skill set, then you confuse things. And what I mean by that is that uh, I told you a story about meeting someone that um, helped me train in a very kind of um, unexpected way. Uh, you know, like he, he was a brawler, and he always he wanted to learn. He was learning eskrima. He was learning a little bit of jujitsu. He was uh, learning muay thai. And he was always fighting. And when I got a chance to spar with him, and I'd use the word spar, even though it was a lot more aggressive than I was used to, I realized that he was just way better a fighter than I was. And um, by that time, I had my black belt in Shotokan, and he had no belt <laughs> in any art. I think he I think he was going to test for blue belt or he was getting at that level because he was telling me he was about he was the one who really introduced me to like the guard. Uh, and by that time, I had done a little bit of grappling. But to be fair, there was nothing that I would compare as to like training fully in the martial arts. So, so Danny, so is it what it, so you had a black belt and, you know, he, but he was a better ball, better brawler. So, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be a devil's advocate right here and say, then do the belts even matter? I mean, what is the point of training and getting the skill set when, you know, it didn't, it's not practical or, or not in that particular situation? Yeah, that's a great place to kind of think about it because I didn't feel embarrassed. I want to say that like that moment, uh, for those that want to go back and listen to that story, I think it's episode four. Uh, I didn't feel embarrassed. I felt uh, very open because this is someone I trusted. So it's like if you and me sparred and you've been doing Muay Thai for longer than I and you're able to just beat me in, in, the, in the ring. Uh, I trust you and I know that like afterwards, I might even laugh like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you did that move. That was awesome. But I would never feel embarrassed in front of you because of the dialogue. That's how, I, that's how that day was. But I did go home thinking that I would have gotten beat up if he had, if it had been a real encounter with him. But maybe not, because what we did is we set out a day of sparring. So it was very much within the rules, you know, so that I didn't try and hurt him by hitting him in vulnerable spots. You know, I didn't even try and run away, which I, I might have, you know, I didn't try and trick him. So the, one of the things I realized is that like, as another example, so let me just flip it. Um, one of the things that one of my senseis used to do is that whenever he would get into talks with people that wanted to test him, he would ask them to wear a gi and join them in the, on, the, on the dojo. And I thought that was hilarious at first. And then later on, I thought that was genius because what he was doing was come into my world, put on a uniform like I put a uniform. You don't have to fight like I fight, but I want you to enter my space and we will spar. 
we will fight. And um, surprisingly, it was always in his favor because one is that he was, it's almost like when, when you tell a boxer, let's fight, and the boxer says, come into the ring and only use your hands. And that's, that's a great place for the boxer. And I was like, but what if I want to throw you to the floor? It's like, nah, you're coming into my world. We're going to do it this way. So to the point about, like, does it even matter? I think in the talk about what that belt meant, um, no, I think uh, Sammy would have laughed. Like, that belt means very little to me because I can show you that I'm better than you. But I would argue that that belt was different for me. Uh, one is that the belt, uh, my, at least in my understanding of Shotokan, uh, was that it meant that I had, I had a level of proficiency in the basic tools of that art. I would compare it to going back to our, our academic training, that you have a level of proficiency in writing. It doesn't mean you can write a dissertation. It doesn't mean that, that there are not better people that can put together a poem, you know? So that's where I stand in, in the model of like the belts. And, and maybe that's where we, we, we want to think about this divide between uh, traditional martial arts and the question of skill sets. Um, but let me pause there because I feel that I might, might have rambled on. So your question is like, do they even matter? I say they do. It just depends how you want to frame the question of like, where does it matter and when does it matter? Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, that one, um, you know, referencing Bruce Lee again, you know, when he fought that one, um, the closed door fight, you know, when when the Chinese people challenged him, when, that, when the traditional Chinese martial arts uh, I don't know. That's the, the the group of the schools challenged him um, in San Francisco. You know because um, you know if he lost that fight, you know Bruce wouldn't teach, and if Bruce won, then he would continue to teach. After after coming out of that fight, you know Bruce Lee said that he needed to learn more than one style because one style was not enough to beat that guy. Even though uh, he knew he he could beat him, you know he, he could have done it more quickly and more efficiently uh, with more than one. So, you know, I, I respect the traditional martial arts schools and stuff like that and t the traditional styles. But, you know, I think nowadays we have to do more than one. Everybody knows more than one. Everybody in quotes knows more than one. I mean, I don't know. I, I think, I think um, you know, it would be, you know, I don't know. I think it's silly that some people are still stuck in just one traditional martial art thinking that it's great. I mean, you know, I've mentioned before, but, you know, seeing, you know, I, I, you know, I'm born and raised in the Chinese culture, but, you know, I will always watch a Wing Chun guy get beat up by a Muay Thai guy any day. I will, you know, there's a sense of weird pleasure in that, seeing that there's somebody who really thinks their style is so good. It's just like uncomparable to anything else. And it's kind of laughable. What do you think? Well, I'd like to return to that uh, way I posed the question, which is like, if we're asked, does a belt even matter? That might be a way of extending a synonymous question of like, do traditional martial arts that give belts have a place in a world a fighting that does not care about ranks, belt, uh, you know, certificates and so forth, and, and this model of tradition. Um, I want to extend it further and think about um, this question, which says, I think it all depends when and where you are having this conversation, so that if we are going to place this conversation within like fighting in a ring, um, I think it's good because it'll give you a result, but it's also misleading because one of the things that I feel about martial arts is that we've learned to think of martial arts as a sport or a discipline that can become a sport, that you can test it. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, that fight with Bruce Lee, and I may be getting it wrong, but it's uh, Wong Jack, uh, Wong Jack Man 
uh, who is that person that you're referencing, and they they fight, and as the narrative goes, the the experience left Bruce Lee really thinking about the confines of the discipline and how that teaches you how to fight. And to return to where we've been talking about, you know, we it's called, you know, re-roll multiple martial arts and think about its place in, in culture and society. As we think about that, I reference a lot of my own research in another field and that has to do identity studies. And I keep posing this question that when I think about modeling identity as a category, I ask myself that the tools I use to research frame the outcome. So if I'm going to test my martial arts, but I tell you, let's just stand up and let's go into a ring. I've already confined so much there. I am going to get an output and maybe you win or maybe I win. But if I pretend that that is an objective result, it's not true. I framed a lot of variables. And one of the things I used to joke around, I don't know if I joke with you around about this model of like traditional martial arts. And by tradition, I mean like karate, Okinawan style, maybe Wing Chun, and thinking like, did they not ever throw themselves to the ground? You know, because I thought that was a weird, like, like these, these ways of fighting that are really good stand up, even Muay Thai, even Muay Thai. Like, I, I learned a couple of the trips and the takedowns, but I remember the first time I got tripped, I pulled the person and put them in the guard, you know, and then the person's laughing and pushes me up, like, stop that. And I'm like going like, okay, I'll do that. But there was no way that if that was the street position, that person was going to get away from there. Like that person was at a loss. But Danny, gentlemen, don't fight on the ground. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's Kano. That's Judo. That's exactly what I'm talking about. He was so, in the Judo tradition, he really disliked fighting on the ground. He thought it was, quote unquote, uncivilized, dirty, ungentlemanlike. And when I think about your question about, like, do belts even matter? And maybe it sounds like we're all over the place, but I don't think we're that far off. I think it's still finite in the question that says there's this realm that we call traditional martial arts that is very structured in its teaching and also has a ranking organization. Um, the question I think for me is, what does that belt mean? I felt that um, that belt was, and, and, and it goes back to what you asked me last time, did, do, did I consider myself a martial artist? And I didn't, because I never believed that if I had a black belt, I could take on anyone on the street. I never believed that. And not because I felt intimidated, it was because it didn't make sense. Like, I was like, I was learning something that I practiced a lot. I mean, I would say I was putting in, I don't know, let's say five to six hours a week. If you go th three times a week, um, you're probably doing like six hours a week of training. And most people are not training six hours a week and how to punch, how to kick, how to block, how to inflict pain and avoid pain. So the only thing I had was an advantage that I was actively training in that scenario. But if someone came, yeah, especially when I was just doing Shotokan, if someone came up to me and did like bear hugged me and just swung me over like a wrestler would, there's nothing in my training other than hoping that I could have stopped it before it got there. So I think that I the belts matter because they give you an understanding of where you are within your own discipline. And they probably matter a little bit as you interact with people who are not trained. I mean, I respect traditional martial arts. You know, I think that it's a good, you know, there's different foundations and a different use for different scenarios because it has worked in one time or another in order for this art to continue to go through. If it didn't work, then it would have been long gone. Um, but, you know, how it's evolved and how people use it in the situation, you know, I think it's a different story. I mean, I remember when, um, you know, some, you know, I, I, I respect, tr you know, tradition, you know, I um, when, you know, seeing young, for example, seeing young MMA guys 
beat up old traditional martial artists, I that's not really uh, my thing. You know, I don't see any honor or any like bragging rights when you know a twenty-something-year-old is beating up on a on a you know sixty-year-old old guy. You know, that's that doesn't make sense. But you know, um, but there's also a sense where tradition means that something is fixed it is um there and it is not changing therefore it is arguably immobile and arguably dead so you know if we're stuck on these traditional things does that mean that we've kind of just stuck in the past or are we taking these traditional things and applying them in a more present day uh, situation where we can give it new life because you know I think utilizing certain things can be helpful you know can be can have good skill sets but um, but it, but it has to be renewed and and refreshed let me just pose this question again to you and it has to do with this question of like identity studies um, the academic assessment of what you know the things we try and make sense of i'm very much very critical of the term traditional in all the different ways i don't like the word tradition and i don't like the word traditional the reason i don't like them is because i find them um, to be uh, relative so they tra to me tradition just means that you have a memory that this came before you and you can have a narrative that there's 10 generations going back. But traditions and traditional is just where, we, where you are today. Because in the past, it wasn't traditional. In the past, it was modern. It was revolutionary. It was new. And that's why I struggle with this conversation of this dichotomy of traditional martial arts versus modern or MMA Um but I think there is something there because um, where I am right now in reflecting on, on mainly traditional martial arts, and what I mean by traditional martial arts is that martial arts that literally have a textbook. I remember buying uh, magazines that were telling me, like, this is the right way of punching. This is the right stance. And if I'm going to make that argument, then I think MMA is becoming traditional too because you can buy books on MMA, you can buy books on jiu-jitsu that are locking in the technique of this is the right technique. The only thing that I want to maybe give some credit to modern martial arts or multiple martial arts or MMA is that they are very much adamant about rejecting the fixed. You know, I feel that there's this conversation about um, as soon as something stops working, you abandon it and you pick up another. Because that's what seems to be a trend, in, at least in MMA, uh, the sport version of it. But uh, the traditional martial arts, I think you, you make a great point that it's tested against people that um, are inaccurate. It goes back to what I said earlier, that the, the models we use to test will give us a product, but they're confined by the experiment. So calling out your master, which means reason I think about the master is that that person who holds knowledge. So uh, in my respective field, I have a lot of different masteries and I'm not trying to be cocky there, but I've invested so much that I have a lot of material. But that's all I can say. I'm, I'm sure I, in fact, I, I know that there are people with less, ex less experience in anthropology and ethnic studies and law that can challenge because there's moments where they go, wow, that was a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. You've just challenged me. But when, but that's, I'm not going to be injured because it's an intellectual debate or a practice debate. But if I, as a master of a physical art, have to prove my art because my body is 60 to someone that's 25, I would say this, you age to 65 and meet me. Or let me figure out how to get to 25 while holding all the material I have right in my head, and we can test it. That's impossible, obviously. So therefore, these tests are not working. The one thing that I do think is credible is when you get a, uh, a Wing Chun person who's been training for three years and is 25 years old, 
Again, someone who's been training for three years in MMA and is 25 years old, they both weigh 155 pounds and they get in the ring. That now, now that's a little bit more complicated because even then, people go, "I already saw that one," and the Wing Chun person lost. The reason why they lost is the reason why I lost that day with Sammy. Dude, I, I, I had never tested my kicks in that way. I, I was able. For example, when we sparred before in Shotokan, I was able to land my kick to the person's stomach and maybe maybe to their face. But I had never really swung it trying to break a rib or break a jaw. And I can tell you this, that dude, my buddy Sammy, he had. <laughs> he had practiced it with that intent. So I thought, oh, okay, I get it. It's different context. Well, what comes to mind for you? Like, here's what I was thinking about about this conversation that you pose. When you at, when you asked, do belts even matter? I think that's hugely significant because I grew up in a generation that if you had a black belt, you walked around thinking you could beat up people, that you could handle yourself in the street. And I don't know if that was the right mindset, unless unless I missed something. So. How do, you, how do you think about belts? What do they mean to you? I agree that, you know, um, the martial arts schools or the schools, different sc styles um, are contextual to that um, situation. And, you know, I mean, let's just take Taekwondo, for example. Some of that stuff, you know, Taekwondo has evolved into very sport-like, where it's predominantly... Uh, kicks and some people have some super flashy kicks and it's amazing athleticism i mean does that mean that someone's going to do like you know a triple kick in real life and and you know kick three people in the face at the same time probably not but having trained and being able to do that um shows a lot of dedication and i think it's respectable i mean i don't think anybody would see you know those those triple spin kicks you know kicking three four pieces of wood um you know i don't think anybody would say that's that's stupid or um unimpressive but but what does a black belt mean um I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough. You know, it's also really tough to say because every school is different. You know, saying, you know, like a, a 10 year old kid in one school can get a black belt, but it means different for that 10 year old to have a black belt than, you know, the, the 30 year old with a black belt. And then, you know, in a different school, like, you know, a, a, a particular karate school versus a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school where it takes 10 years to get a black belt. Or, you know, so on and so forth. I don't know. It's it's almost like... It's like winning... It's like getting enough recognition. And it means a lot. But sometimes... It could mean not as much to some people. And I, I don't want to... But at the same time, I don't want to disrespect anybody's art or, or craft or anything like that because I, you know, I respect everybody's, uh, um, you know, martial arts style, everybody's school. Um, but I'm just trying to make sense of, you know, what it means to have a black belt because um, I've never gotten a black belt. I think I'd be pretty proud if I had a black belt because, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's like getting, you know, a, a really good uh, higher education degree. You know, I'd be pretty proud of that. Um, but, you know, it's and, and I don't want to be rambling here, but, you know, I could I could have I, I could have a Ph.D. in in, you know, say. Pottery making, but, you know, if you if you put me in, in a room full of concrete, I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't know how to, you know, work with that substance because it's, it's not my forte um is that comparable pose, at all 
I agree. I think it works really well because as I think about this conversation, um, I'm grounding it on your question, which is, you know, this idea of thinking about martial artists, um, the ranking system, the traditional context in which we learned martial arts. And many of the older uh, martial art fields will speak of a moment that didn't have belts, you know, so that um, Funikoshi, for example, didn't, let, it's an Okinawan style, a Shotokan, but even Kenjuturu, which I mentioned was the first one I learned, um, they didn't get the ranking till Japan took over their art and they got it from Judo. And Judo uh, picked it up as the nation state institutionalized the art and made it Budo. And I was, I'm, I'm reflecting on what, the, what does that belt mean? And I think it really just means that within that tradition, there's a way of giving you credit for what you've learned and also managing the respective dojo. Because when you are given a black belt in some traditions, that grants you authority to teach the art. You get a formal certificate and you can put it on your wall and it, it's, a, it's a form of lineage that your sensei has granted you authority because they've given you credit that you have proficiency in the basics of this art and you can now instruct someone else. Um, in jiu-jitsu, you make a strong point that um, it, it, on average, it's about a 10-year process and people get upset maybe because like, why did it take so long? Because it isn't about technique completely. Yes, it is about technique. If you have a black belt, you're expected to know a lot. And be able to perform it. You can't just know it intellectually. Your body has to be able to perform it. But um, I don't know if this applies in Brazil, but in the United States, you're, you're called professor as soon as you get a black belt. Even if you don't teach. Uh, I, I got to see my classmates hit the rank of black belt. And immediately they were professors. And they weren't teaching yet. Some of them started teaching later, but... I found it very much appropriate to how you compared it to like having a doctorate in respective field. And when you say, well, then does it even matter? I think it, it's a yes and a no. One is I think it does matter within the field you're in because that's how the organization is structured. It's a way of managing all the respective uh, people, their interests, their desires, and their, even, even the chaos that is possible within the, the dojo. Like you respect the, your elders, you respect those with more ranking. Um, I found it interesting that in jujitsu, uh, there was a lot of hesitation to reproduce the, the formalized rituals of Shotokan, but yet they still do a lot like that. You know, for example, there, in, in my lot of do dojos, if you're a lower rank uh, student, you don't ask a higher rank to roll you get asked from a higher rank, but you don't go to a black belt. Hey, you want to row? They usually think of that as rude. I think that's, I like it. I like it. I, I'm, I'm a, a stickler for these weird arbitrary rules. Uh, I think it has to do with my anthropology background. I'm, I'm, I like the adaptive functions of rules of behavior to keep us safe. But I find that interesting. You know, like, so if you ask, does it even matter what belt you have? It does in the mat. Some some places you don't go up to a purple belt if you're a white belt and just say, hey, you want to roll? You, no. But a purple belt can go up to a white belt and say, do you want to roll? You know, so I think it does matter. And it does matter also in the street. A purple belt should defend themselves better than a white belt. A black belt, I don't know if I don't I don't know at what point it becomes arbitrary. There, there's that running line that if you punch a black belt in the, in the face in a fight in the street, they become a, a brown belt. If you punch them twice, they become a purple belt. And if you punch them three times, they become a blue belt. So I mean, like they keep dropping with the amount of violence that's inflicted on them. But I find it interesting that regardless, I think that ranking is still giving us some merit of insight into the skill set. But I want to return, we may not have time to on this uh, session here of conversation conversing but that like i think that's the difference between martial artist being a martial artist and just being a practitioner because there's people that are amazing fighters no ranking and no interest in teaching 
no, no interest in upholding any field. They are just people who can handle themselves and may be dangerous to others. Well, with that said, this has been the Reroll Martial Arts Podcast, an intersection between martial arts, society, and culture. Until next time, peace. <laughs> We're out. <laughs> <laughs>